conjunction with African American Studies uh, for our Hot Topic series. And so we have some really, really great folks on the panel this year, moderate, moderated by our, our one and only Dr. Dewana Naomi Goldstone. So, so like, folks trying to get your credit. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but I will let, I will kind of turn it over to her and let her kind of roll with the panel. And so you guys can do it. All right, I'm going to ask them some questions. Oh, this mic is on. I better be careful. Um, I'm going to ask some questions, and then we'll have plenty of time to take questions. Though, if you want to ask a question in the middle of it, feel free to ask a question in the middle of it. All right, so I'm going to start with uh, Mrs. Lee Hall, who is President Hall's wife, and that's the last thing I'll say. Because she has her own identity. Yes. So I'm going to. So I want her to introduce herself and tell us about your current relationship status. Okay. Current relationship status is good. <laughs> um, Tim and I met when we were 15 and 16, and I um, had just become Christian the night before. If he'd met me before then, he would not have liked me. Um, <clears throat> we started dating about a year and four months later. We dated for four years and four days before we got married. And we've been married 36 years, and I haven't killed him yet. <laughs> so, doing good. And you have two kids. Oh, we have two kids. Uh, more importantly, we have four dogs. <laughs> no. uh, we have a 27-year-old son and a about to turn 22-year-old daughter. Both of those are students here. And would you recommend your students meet their husband at 15 and get married at 19? Well, I was 20, oh. but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, because it worked out for you. But there's reasons. Right, okay. All right, I'm going to come back to that. Okay. All right, Chris Pointer was one of my students. When were you my student? Like 2007? When you first got here. No, you're giving away my age. Yes. Were you really? Yes. Well, when you first class? So Chris Pointer was one of my, using my world lit, world lit class in 2001 or 2002? 2000, yeah, yeah. 2000, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, and when you came, you were dating Andrea, no, Andrea. You, you weren't dating her? No, but you were, when you guys were in my class together, you were dating Yes. See? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so tell us. And he played baseball, but go ahead, tell, tell us the rest of who you are. My awesome Peter, just life in general. Well, keep it brief, because you've had a long life. Okay, thank you. <laughs> very, still very young. Uh, Chris Pointer, uh, I am uh, from Columbia, Tennessee, and I, uh, I run a boys and girls club back at home. Something I'm passionate about, love doing, and uh, I did meet my wife here on the campus of Austin yeah. State University. So, uh, didn't meet her in Dr. Goldstone's class. So, I definitely have some shots for her before I leave out of here. I just only owe her that for the excellent job she did in teaching me. So, you all take notes so y'all can use this as fuel to, to for the fire and these extra credit points that she'll give you for not using it on her. So, uh, but uh, yes, we have we have two beautiful children. I have a daughter that is three and uh, another daughter that is one. And so I'm the only male in the house, so y'all continue to pray for me. <laughs> I, I just do what they tell me to do, and I just kind of fall in line. So, uh, uh, but for the most part, that's it. And we met, like I said, we met here on campus, and uh, we've been together ever since. So. What position did you play? Where? Baseball. Oh, you told me to keep it brief. <laughs> and when I got to Austin P, I was the, I, I got to Austin P on uh, athletic and academic scholarship. So. Played baseball here at Austin P. We won three uh, Division One OVC championships, so I got three rings for that. Uh, and so then also, uh, my also was a master's graduate student here in the African American Culture Center. So a lot of the programs that you see was very instrumental in, in, in getting to fruition. Like pea soup that y'all see, we do. Uh, I don't know if y'all do the spot anymore. That's a program that we used to do. So a lot of those different programs and activities and stuff that, that I've heard are still kind of going on. So I'm kind of excited about that. So. Anything else you want to tell? That's it. Thanks for coming back. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Amanda. She was not one of my students, but can I tell them how I know you? That's fine. Okay. Um, Amanda was in Gamma Sigma Sigma, which I advise. And I also got the pleasure of marrying Amanda and her partner, Ayesha. Okay. So if you ever get married. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Amanda Foster Brown. I'm originally from Clarksville. Uh, Went to Austin P a couple of different times, um, but eventually finished um, in 2009. Um, I met my wife here, but we didn't date while we were both here, if that makes sense. But um, 
We've been together seven years. Uh, next month will be four years married. Um, we both live and work in Nashville. Um, some of you might have seen me, I work at Nashville Cares, and so sometimes I come down with Dwayne um, with his programs and all of his craziness. Um, I don't have any kids yet, but I do have two really cute dogs, and that's about it. They're not as cute as I like Hi, my name is Ernie Smith. I am from Memphis, Tennessee. I am a senior here. Uh, my major is education. And um, right now, I'm in a relationship. We've been together for a year now. And that's pretty much it. I'm involved with the Mount Zion College Ministry on Austin Peace Campus. I'm Christian Wilson. I'm originally from Wyoming. And I'm a junior here. Austin Peay with a major in sociology. I'm prior to military and current ROTC here. And uh, I'm currently single. <laughs> Can I tell him why I picked you? Yeah, sure, go ahead. All right. One of my students recommended him because they said he's a male whore. <laughs> not, not true. Not true. He said sponsor. Sorry. All right, so the first question I'm going to ask is how you all remember your first love. We already heard yours, Mrs. Hall. We won't hear yours again. But I do want to get back to that question. But Chris, your first love? My first love was Greg Ellis. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> ah, in first grade. In first grade. <laughs> <laughs> it's my first kiss. Uh-oh. Say so probably my first, I won't say, I won't say love, because really fully understood that other than the word, but I would go back to my first just like major crush, it's infatuation if you will, second grade, Teresa Harlan, I'll never forget, you know, sure was, and then she dumped me for some light skinned dude, she said, I remember that vividly, so uh, yeah, second grade, I remember it like it was yesterday, like it was yesterday, walking the halls in MacDowell Elementary, yeah. So I had, to, I had to overcome that, that, that dark skin complex out there. It's all good. Though, huh? it's great now. You know? You're not bitter about it? No, not bitter. You know, I only, I only stalked her in third grade. <laughs> but I'm good now. I'm good. I moved on to bigger and better things in my life. So. Thank you. You're, you're so welcome. You asked me. Oh, come on, gosh. Come on, I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this was worth you or Ernie. Yeah. You guys were here last year with Ernie. All right, Amanda. Um. I really, I wasn't doing all that in elementary school. I was like racing people and doing spelling bees. Yeah. Um, but I guess my first, well, I thought I was like, oh, I love, um, was probably like middle school. And I was like, oh, I'm so in love. And somebody told me I was cute. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, but it wasn't, you know. I mean, of course, now I'm like, that was not love. But <laughs> back then, I thought I was, you know, hot stuff. So. Um. My first love was in high school. I dated, his name was Michael Humphrey. And at that time, I was going through this phase where I was always the good girl. I stayed in church. But if you were bad, you were my type of guy. So he had these long dreads, and he sagged his pants. And my parents hated him. And we dated, <laughs> we dated from freshman year until my senior year, right before Valentine's Day. This night dumped me. It was like, I just can't do this whole relationship thing. So that was my first little, I won't say heartbreak, but my little feelings was hurt. But that was my first love. Christian, do you have a story to share? Or? Well, it sounds like he's going to have a lot. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, <laughs> no um, first love, I mean, it was in high school. You know, it sounds cliche, but it was. Uh, it was freshman through junior year. And uh, it was, I was actually, I went to school at, uh, back in Wyoming. And this was, you know, I was about to graduate. I was, because I graduated early. I was about to graduate. And I was thinking of joining the military. And that's actually why we broke up. Is she didn't want to date a military guy. Oh. It's fine. It's fine. It's for the best, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what's the one thing you know now about dating that you wished you'd known? When you first started dating. I'm good. <laughs> That's right, you're not dating. But what can you tell them? What advice can you give them? Oh, dang, you don't want to open, just, you don't want to just get an open floor like that. Oh, gosh. 
I mean, I'll just cut you off. How about if I cut you off? Just one piece of advice you give to one of these young people who are dating. One piece, just one. <laughs> like, I have a question that might get you started. Okay. Because um, I'm kind of in a similar situation. I've um, my, my boyfriend and I met when I was 15. We've been dating for we've been about two and a half years, almost three. Um, and we he's actually coming to Austin P because I'm here and we hope to stay together and get married and et cetera down the road. I call it 10. 24, 25. Um, I guess it's kind of a similar situation, so advice along those lines. Sounds good. It's <laughs> planned. <laughs> oh, God, I got a whole bunch of advice. Um, oh. Don't live together. How's that? Don't live together. Until you're married. Until you're married. She has a bit after your face. <laughs> no. Oh, no. What? Oh, no. Uh, I guess, yeah. Don't live together before you get married. It greatly increases your chance of divorce. It greatly lowers your uh, satisfaction and happiness. Likely to be married. Huh? Likely to be getting married. Huh? Likely to be getting married. Uh, well. Yeah, and uh, what happens with a lot of people is they wind up. I mean, come on. You move in with somebody to save money? Doesn't that? I mean, that's just broken on the on the surface of it. But so frequently, people will like move in together because, well, it makes sense. We could save money or whatever, or yeah, I like you, or my toothbrush is in your drawer anyway. And you, you move in with someone that you would not have considered marriage material. And then you just kind of fall into getting married to someone that, because there's no room in your life for a better person, a person that you would have wanted to marry. So too many people, I think this is part of why uh, the statistics should scare you off of it to begin with, um, and just the rampant, I don't even know the word, I can't even think of a word, American gluttony to say I'm going to move in with you to save money, I mean, you're a check, a paycheck for me, you're going to cut off part of my rent, I mean, that's just twisted. So, um, anyway, there we go. So what if they say they're moving in together because they want to see if they're marriage material? You will not find that out living, uh, living together. You will find that out by knowing each other for two years. You know that's a big deal for me. Minimum two years. Do not get married before you've known someone well for two years. And live in the same town, not this long distance nonsense. Unless you write every day. We wrote every day. We had boxes of letters. People, they, didn't even so. have, they didn't have telephones when you were born. <laughs> <laughs> She's right. <laughs> She's right. We rode bikes everywhere. They rode four Uphill each direction. <laughs> In the snow. In the snow. Ways. On the Gulf Coast of Texas. But yeah. um, you know, you'll find out if someone's marriage material just by knowing them. Okay, so I'm going to come back time. to this idea of what is marriage material, but I'm going to move sure. on to Chris Pointer, who's married and... I got lots more advice, though. She does. Go ahead. So what, what question are I don't really remember. The one you asked, the one she asked. Whatever one you want to answer. I, it doesn't matter. You tell me. You, you, you would listen. What makes marriage material? What makes marriage material? How did you know uh, Andrea uh, is Andrea, uh, isn't uh, it? It's Andrea. Oh, of course. You're the one of the <laughs> what made you decide you wanted to marry her? What makes marriage material? I mean, really, I mean, it's really a, um, I think, a personal, um, you want me to give the answer, I'll get the answer. Personal, really, I think it's, it's, it's really a personal choice, because I think a lot of times what happens is we have these checklists. Men have checklists, women have checklists. You might as well just ball them up, shred them, throw them out the window. Because nobody's ever going to meet every statistic or every characteristic on your checklist and I think really it's about whether or not the two can actually grow together um, if collectively you can grow together if there's room for a blossoming process because a relationship regardless of what you what anybody may say is really a uh, partnership almost like a business plan in a sense um, and so when you go into a relationship with somebody is there room for growth is there room for development can that person challenge you to be better and can you challenge that person to be better? Um, and then you, you'll begin to feel whatever that feeling may be, it, you know, whether it's in your heart, you know, your gut, whatever it may be, you ultimately begin to understand and know, okay, this is the person you know, that I, that I want to be with for the rest of my life. 
collectively together we can grow. Collectively they have the things that I know that will help finish completing me and I finish completing them. And so when you come to that realization, I think you just kind of know, okay, this is the person that I want to kind of spend my life with and this is the person that I should, should marry because they in turn make marriage material. And then from there, <clears throat> you continue to see how far it's able to stretch if what you're feeling is actually real. Because there are certain signs, there are things that you pick up on. You know, for, for young men, you know, if you're, you're, you're talking to a young lady and everything is great, and then all of a sudden she just starts showing crazy tendencies. <laughs> you just track that pattern out to see how far this crazy tendency pattern will go. And if it's, and if it's persistent enough and you continue to see this realization of, crazy tendencies and you haven't done anything to trigger them being crazy, that might be a sign that you need to get off the beaten path. And the same thing for women. You know, if these, these young men are, are showing you tendencies that they're not going to pan out, you know, don't try to force a, you know, a round circle hole into a, you know, a square block. It's just not going to happen. I don't care how much you want to try to make it work, try to make it fit, it's just not going to happen. So I just, I just say, you know, you know, if that person you can grow with, you have room to grow with, and you can challenge one another to be better, and if there's truly love beyond the whole infatuation, the whole birds and the bees, the first date, going to Rafferty's to eat, whatever, you know, if it's beyond that, and you get down to the to the serious, the nitty gritty stuff, um, you can actually see this person um, being with them for a long period of time. I think that kind of fits the characteristics of marriage too. I think um, if they're cute. <laughs> what does Judge Judy say? Beauty face, dumb as forever. <laughs> um, I think the most important thing, if marriage is your goal, is make sure that you are married, uh, ready for marriage. Um, if you if you have someone that's marriage material and you're not ready for marriage, then it's gonna fail. Um, it's just destined to. Um, secondly, I guess you know no. Know the person that you're with. Pay attention to not only the way that they treat you, but the way that they treat other people, the way that they treat family members, you know, parents and things like that. Pay attention to those things um, and really try to get to know the person that you're with outside of, um, like Chris was saying, that honeymoon stage. Because, of course, it's all fun and games when you're, you know, it's new and you're dating. But when it moves past that, you want to really pay attention to what's going on. Because um, all of that's not going to help you when you encounter, you know, difficulties and things like that and that's a lot of times where people mess up is they're not prepared to encounter those difficult things that you go through together. Well we were sitting over here saying that we don't have an answer for this question just because we're not at that point in our lives. So okay, that's good because the question I want to ask is how will you know that you're ready to get married? Or when will you know? I guess when you feel it, um, prayer. <laughs> <laughs> right now, um, just being 21 and in school, although I am in a relationship, my primary goal is me. And um, I guess marriage hasn't been something that really, been something that I thought of. I, I mean, all I remember is Henderson telling me is, don't know good man, want a bitter woman with bad credit. So, <laughs> I'm just trying to work on my credit. <laughs> and yeah, just living. Um, I've had, I listen to what a lot of married people say because that is my goal one day. And um, I think one, one piece of advice that I got from a, a man was, a man is not who he needs to be until he's who he needs to be in God. Yes. So. If I'm going to be in a relationship, being a God-fearing woman and being into the church and being religious, and I mean, I can't be with someone who's going, who I'm considering going to leave my family, leave my children, and he's all crazy every which way. So I watch those things. Keep working on the credit. I am. <laughs> yeah, your marriage should not be your mission field. <clears throat> should not be your what? Your mission field. What does that mean? Right. Um, missionaries. Mm. It goes to now, it, it, your marriage shouldn't be your mission field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, before I answer, uh, just a little disclaimer. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's good. You're good. I, I'm military, so you're going to get a military standpoint. Uh, you know, being in, in the military, you see a lot of guys come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and, you know, they're 18, 19, they've been away for a year, 
and they marry the first girl that they meet when they get back. I've seen families shattered because of this, and there's usually a kid involved. So I would say don't get married until you know, or until you're, you know, the fog is cleared, I guess, you know, if that makes sense. Uh, because, yeah, you're not thinking straight when you, when you uh, are young and, you know, major life events are happening. You're not thinking straight. I know I wasn't. So just, you know, just take a step back, you know, look at the situation, and if it still looks good after a year, year and a half. Two know, years. Two years. Two years. Two years. Um, <laughs> then, you know, I'd say pray about it, and if you're religious, pray about it, and uh, go from there. One, one thing I would add, especially, I mean, you all are still in college, one thing I would say is that, you know, when you came out, when you came from high school, and you, you know, to me, high school is probably the greatest years of your life. You can't, unless you had something tragic happen in your life, high school is like the greatest years of your life. But college, to me, is the most important years of your life. They're great, but they are the most important because you're you're trying to now establish yourself. You're now living for somebody else. When you was in high school, you were kind of living for yourself, no one else, unless you had some tragedy happen in your family. But in college, you're now setting the, the foundation for everybody else behind you, and then for whatever else you're establishing. So that's why college is so important. So in anything that you do, especially getting into a relationship, you know, take your time, see where it takes you, you know, involve yourself in other things. Get engaged in other things. You know, you are the most important thing because you're working for something greater, for others that are coming behind you, the foundation that you're trying to build. It's great to be lovey-dovey, see that person coming across the campus, see them in the UC, talk on the phone, text, see them at the club. You know, all of that stuff is great. But at the same time, understand that if you invest so much time and energy into somebody else's bubble, and that bubble doesn't work out, you no longer have a foundation for yourself. So make sure that you take your time through whatever the process is. You know, if you're committing yourself to one person, that's great. But still, at the same time, take your time. Don't rush. You know, a lot of times we'll see, like, man, I want to get married. I want to have kids. I want to do this. I want to do that. And if you're like Dr. Goldstone, you're not trying to have no kids. You're trying to have a bunch of dogs. But, you know, whatever the case may be, just take your time in the entire process working your way through the process so that you're learning who you are. You know, you don't really fully understand and know who you are. You know, you're still trying to discover. I'm still trying to figure out who I am, and I'm through with school, twice over. So, I mean, so it's a process. It's a learning process. It takes time. So if I had to, if you remember anything that I say, is just to make sure that in whatever it is that you're doing, you know, take your time. Because that infatuation and love and that spark can force you to kind of rush things. Because it does feel good, it does feel great. Everybody's happy. It's sunny every day. There's not a cloud in the sky. It's not raining. Nothing, you know. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're not prepared for, you know, devastation. You're not prepared for a shift or a change in the climate or the weather, uh, which kind of throws you off because you've been rushing through the whole, the whole thing the whole time. You had not had a lot of time to allow it to soak in and build a stronger foundation so that you can succeed moving forward. Build on something he said. Um, okay, now I'm going to come at this from a, a Christian perspective, just so you know. Um, but I would say d there's only one person to remake yourself for, and that's Jesus. That's not your boyfriend. Um, when Tim and I started dating, um, I, I had a, a very traumatic life. I, I mean, I. I have 15 years of amnesia, okay? Real, we're talking real serious PTSD and, and everything. And um, I fell in love with him so hard. And he was going to like a country Baptist church. And I started, I loved him so much, I wanted him to just love me as much as I loved him. And I kind of started changing myself to fit in with these country Baptists. And so, like, the first time he took me down, I was wearing, you know, like, four-inch heels and, you know, skirt up to about here. And then he took me down to, like, the, the second row, which was a concession because he usually sat on the first row. And, you know, within, like, a year, I was wearing low-heeled, ugly shoes and long dresses and 
I mean, I was remaking myself into the image of a country Baptist who I wasn't. And that didn't charm him, okay? So, I mean, he broke up with me. So I would just say, you know, you, you have uh, all sorts of self-improvement to do. I mean, I'm 56 oh, yeah. this week, 56. And, you know, I'm still, I, I mean, I'm reading my self-help books, and, you know, I'm still working on myself. But don't change yourself to make someone like you. Change yourself to improve who you are, but don't make yourself into someone else's image to get a guy or a girl to like you. Does that, does that resonate for anybody, or is that just me? Okay. Do you want to say something? The name? About being married? Changing yourself? Oh, Can you pay I mean, attention, please? <laughs> well, there's so much saying. I'm paying attention. Um, I mean, definitely don't change yourself just so that they'll like you, because if, my theory, I guess, is if they are attracted to you initially, they like what they see about you, whether that's personality or all of that. Um, I mean, of course you'll change as you get older and grow together and things like that, but in the beginning, you know, I mean, it's already been said, don't change for somebody else. Next time I'm going to do a better, better job of picking this panel next time. You don't keep up bad attitudes. I don't. I don't want to be repeated. You are good. It's like Chris Pointer and Amanda. <laughs> All right, so, so my, do you guys want to ask any questions? I have lots of questions, but I know people are going to come and go, so go ahead, Tyler. Um, you had mentioned, uh, I've heard you mention a lot of the difference between actual love and infatuation, you know, wait so much time because you're young and blah, blah, blah. And we always hear that, that you're young, you don't know. At what point are you old enough that you know? I mean, I think you, I mean, I think really age has nothing really to do with it. What, what I was referring to is making sure that you know, you understand the difference between the two. Because typically, for the most part, young men, especially on a college campus, and you go from a high school, you come to a college campus, there's beautiful women everywhere, every grade, you know, your eyes are buck, you're looking at them, you know what I mean, you see them everywhere, and your, your draw naturally is because of their beauty, you know, and how they look, you know, and then the second thing is, okay, intellectually, 90% of the time, and what comes out of their mouth. Um, and so, typically, you know, I think it's a process by which, you know, we have to, I guess, articulate ourselves based on the conversation that we're having, based on the relationship that we have, to determine whether or not this person that I'm fully engulfed with, I'm fully in love with, that I, I fully want to commit myself to. Because I think a lot of times um, we can confuse, like, um, you know, I really like this person a lot, I really care about this person a lot. But it's not so much so that I that I don't really like this person a lot, and really like this person a lot, and really care about this person a lot, you know. And it, and sometimes it's hard to. Because typically, when you just really fall for somebody, you don't see anything else. When you fully love somebody, like you don't see anything else. You know, I call it the, the above the water syndrome. Like you you see clear, you know, your mind is focused, it's targeted on one person, and no matter what's coming at you from all different directions, no matter what's knocking on your door, you still only see that one person. You know, you're looking in a crowded room of just beautiful women and you pinpoint that one out every time and nothing else matters. You don't quiver, you don't shake, you don't anything, you know, that your your heart, mind and commitment is for that. But I don't think it I don't think an age has anything to do with it. I think when you have all of these signs and things to kind of tie together, I think you just kind of know. That's just me personally. I mean, people may feel different. Some people may say you got to be 35. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there have actually been studies on this, and I love infatuation. I mean, who doesn't? Infatuation is, is, is great, but it has a lifespan, and its maximum lifespan is two years. And this is psychology studies that infatuation lasts two years and then you find out what is my rock bottom uh, emotion. Do I, now that I know their faults and all, do I still love them? And it, it's good to have, know what that rock bottom is, what your real, because, okay, you know who you are <laughs> at your best, right? And I'm sure you are a fabulous person at your best, right? <laughs> Tyler? 
Are we talking about him? Uh, yeah, we are. I <laughs> am sure that you are a fabulous person at your best. But who are you at your worst? Not so fabulous. And it's the same thing with the girl. She has her best her, which is fabulous. And she has her worst her. And you don't know where where is the difference? How big is that? <laughs> How big is that bell curve going on here? So you need to know, I mean, she needs to know who are you at your worst because your worst is an authentic part of who you are. Your best is authentic. Your worst is authentic. And the thing about this infatuation is it pulls out your best and it makes you believe that that's who you are. It makes you believe that you are your best person. And so you can be all these things and you'll be this faithful man and blah, 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 blah. And she's at her best and she believes that's who she really is. And it's great. I mean, it's great. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not, nothing wrong with exploring who you are at your best. But you just have to give that two years. And it'll come back. I mean, I mean, oh, my God, there he is. <laughs> I was just about to say, my heart still goes faster when I see him. If, if, you know, if, I, if I may, I wanted to direct. No, you may not. I'm, I'm not friend. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question. So I love him at his best, and I love him at his worst. But what about when you're really mad at him? Well, I haven't killed him yet, so we're okay. good. So you're still here. Yeah. But no, no, I get really mad. I have a hot temper. He doesn't have a hot temper, so he's always saying, you got such a bad temper, you get so mad at me. But that's me, <laughs> that's me at my worst. But my thing is, my thing is, is before I got married, I thought there was infatuation and then there was just nothing. But it's not true. There's infatuation and there's real love, and I, I still get pitter-patters over him, and you know I started saying that before. I knew he was standing there. That's true. Uh, so get the pitter-patters. So, Anyway, there you go. That's my two years. Two years. Okay. No. Yeah, okay. okay. I just wanted to direct a similar, similar question to you know, our, our younger panelists. Um, because, no, for the reason, no, for the reason being that, uh, you know, I have to laugh at all my questions. But, uh, <laughs> but no, for um, So as people who have not made the transition from infatuation to love and then to marriage and having a span of several years to you know, look at that person, you determining your best and worst within two years, you know, is that is that gonna be enough for you? How will you decide that? What is it that makes you realize, okay, I'm not infatuated with this person, but I love them and we're gonna make this work anyway. I'm assuming moving on towards ways. I'm sorry, I didn't understand you your question. Okay. How's Sam? <laughs> how are you gonna uh, how, how, how will you decide? When, when is will your you point? she says two years, he says when you know, when this, that's the only person that you see, what is that for you? What would that be for you when you like, okay, I've seen this and I've seen this and that's the person I want. You're in a relationship. Um I don't know. I guess with me. I, I'm kind of different from other people as a girl, which is strange. I'm afraid of commitment. And. No, I was too. Yeah. Oh, you are? Yeah. Okay. So typically, when I meet a guy, we talk for at least a year before I even make things official. And he stays around? <laughs> if he wants me, he will. <laughs> <laughs> she worked on it. <laughs> so, like, for example, with my boyfriend. We talked for a year. He got to see me at my worst. I've seen him at his worst. So kind of like Miss Hall said, you see that I can still tolerate him because I haven't killed him yet. I've gotten close, but I haven't. <laughs> and um, I still, when I, I, I get happy when I see that he calls or texts me or, I don't know, those iPhones have these cute little emoji thingies. I love those. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> We can be mad at each other and we still care. It's just when we we both have realized the goal that we want in our relationship and all the other stuff doesn't matter. And so that's kind of how we know. I, I can't really answer your question because we have decided in our relationship we're just going to take it day by day. You know, we kind of feel when we start planning we just screw things up. So we're just going to take how he is today and how I am today and work on that. Okay, so what if he wants to get married tomorrow, but you're different tomorrow? But I'm different tomorrow? You know what I'm saying? No, for real. You change. You change and you grow. That's what we're talking about. Like, as you grow in your relationship and you change your relationship, 
and then he wants to get married, well, maybe he's a little different, maybe he's this, maybe he's that. How does that affect your decision? Then that, that's something for discussion. Um, I'm a believer that communication is the number one key in a relationship. I can't be with you, and I feel that something's different, and I haven't expressed it now. I ain't going to nag you, but you and I are going to sit down and have this conversation to see what we need to change. I mean, I can't speak on tomorrow because tomorrow is not here. That's in the Bible. Today got its own tomorrow worries. Does, yeah. yeah, and tomorrow we'll worry about that tomorrow, but that's something that we'll have to go into conversation. I was thinking about that this morning because I was like, what if I get proposed to and <laughs> <laughs> I ain't ready to get married, you know? I was thinking about that, but I don't have an answer to it. I guess I just deal with it at that well, moment. there's your answer. Yeah, yeah you, you can answer about it. But I also think this to say... I can't worry about tomorrow is not true because if that were the case, you wouldn't be in school. Right? Well, so you're always yeah. preparing for tomorrow. We're preparing, but it's, tomorrow is not consuming my thoughts. Sure it is, because that's why you'll go home and study. <laughs> Will I? Maybe. That's <laughs> why <laughs> so you're supposed to go home. <laughs> Do you want to go first or do you want to? You got a question? Um, I had a question. Um, basically, from what I got from the answers to that question was, um, know yourself before you can actually get Before you can wreck yourself? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but like basically because um, the, the point at which you guys were ready to get married um, was described so differently. It, it feels like that like that's just the point that you knew that that was how you were supposed to feel. Like you knew yourself well enough to know that this is what you wanted and that's where you wanted to go. And is that right? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you one thing. For me, when you talk about marriage, making that leap, I proposed, of course, I was in my master's, and it was in October when I proposed. And I knew that I was I was at a place where about to start working, we'll be leaving Austin P. start working. She was already working. Um, she's a nurse. Um, she's a nurse educator now. She oversees three floors at Murray Regional. And so, my plan was, okay, I know that I want to propose, I know I want to be with this person, but when, when we got married, actually the marriage process itself was pretty much was easy. And what I mean by that was it was, the st it was still the same, what I call individual mindset. We were married, we still did things together, but like I would still be off, I would do my thing, she would still go off, she was still doing her thing, but what changed all of that? where the whole, where the rubber meets the road, where you truly have to come together like partnership, working together on the same page, dotting all your I's, crossing all your T's. You love each other, you're all together when you get married. But when we had kids, everything changed completely. It wasn't me worrying about myself. It was, you know, and I always, you know, I was the, the taking care of the home. I loved her, took care of her. Coming home every night, we went out to eat, went to the movies. But when we had kids, there was another entity, a person in the house that was dependent on both of us. So that altered our complete thought process, our frame of thought, who we were, what we were doing, how we had to do it. And you could no longer remain in what I would call like a selfish frame of mind. And what I mean by that is, when I mean selfish frame of mind, meaning, all right, I got to go to work. I can stay as late as I need to. I got to finish all this paperwork. I'm coming home, she'll be there, she's watching TV, reading a book, she finished cooking, or she's doing stuff for work, everything's great, get up, kiss each other, see you after this afternoon, may do lunch, something like that, but when you got a child, all of that changes. Like, you're now making an even greater sacrifice beyond self for the greater good of another. And that really challenged our marriage, because we were having to both sacrifice because we were both still in tune to our careers, building who we were as individuals, people. But that kind of really shifted. And had we not had a strong enough foundation, and we did have kids, it would have been really rocky. It's still a transitioning phase. It was a transitioning phase trying to get here to Austin P. Because it was like, all right, I'm getting ready to go to Austin P. Go back to our stomping grounds. Can you go? She's like, well, got to make sure we got a babysitter. Got to make sure we got somebody to watch the kids. You know, got to make sure I don't have anything to do at work. And I'm like, you know, babe, I really want you to come. Let's bring the kids. Sure. But she's like, look, these are the things that we got to do. These are the things that I got to do, and I'm not going to be able to make it. So I'm having to go solo, but then I'm going to get home late. The kids are still there. They still need your attention. 
it's no jump on the couch, let's watch ESPN, I'm chilling. I'm, no, it's focused. Like, baby's got to get baths. You got to pack diaper bags. And I'm like, seriously? I'm tired. But she's like, I'm tired too. And so that's where a great challenge came up in our marriage. You know, because the marriage thing, the, the, the whole walking down the aisle, the, the, all the nice dresses and the suits and jumping the broom and the reception, all of that 30-minute part, and you spend all that money and feed everybody, you go on this nice honeymoon, and really nothing, a lot of stuff doesn't really change, you know, when you really get married. Because you've seen the best, you've seen the worst. But for me, where it really got challenged, where you really, you really tap into love, is when you have kids. And that's where you, you test, really for me, how strong at the core in a relationship you really are. When you really have true tests, you know, every day about something, especially when it's dealing with your kids. And I find that, you know, fascinating about marriage and relationships. Do you want to? You said, um, you're scared of commitment? I'm sorry? You said you're scared, you were scared of commitment? Oh, no, oh, she, yeah. Oh, you were scared? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. How did you get married? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was 20. But, um, uh, I got my heart broken by the guy before Tim. Um, he, he broke my heart, and, uh, you know, I was a new Christian. I was 15, and I prayed so earnestly, God, please don't let me fall in love again until it's the man I'm supposed to marry. I'm only 15. I can't take getting my heart broken like this, you know, and please, 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 please. So after that, I, um, well, um, <laughs> I was generally dating several guys at the same time, and when I was 16, I was dating a 23-year-old and a 19-year-old and Tim. I was not a hussy, uh, but what was my mother thinking, okay? <laughs> That's what Tim was always going, what was your mother thinking? Um, so anyway, and he just, when he found out, he didn't know I was dating other guys until he called to ask me to a thing, and I said, oh no, I'm going to that with the 23-year-old guy, don't you remember? So anyway, he was real upset, and you know, he wanted me to break up with these other guys, and I was like, uh, no, I'm, you know, I think teenage, he has this long letter I wrote him about how teenage culture forces us into these single relationships, and I think that is just so wrong for a teenage culture to do that, and I'm not going to do that, and blah, 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 and I, uh, he said, <laughs> ultimately he said either break up with them or I can't see you anymore, and so I broke up with, with, with them. Uh, and then he broke up with me the beginning of my sophomore year of college and absolutely devastated me. Devastated me. So I, I was 19 when he broke up with me. So I started, I wound up rebounding on another guy. I'm glad he's already left because he still gets super upset about this. Oh my gosh. I, I rebounded on another older guy and within five weeks he came back and was like, oh, I was so wrong, I love you, marry me. And I'm like, what? You know, five weeks ago, you said, you don't love me, you're not coming back, don't wait for you, blah, 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 blah. And so it took him nine months to, to get me to say I'd marry him. Because I was just like, uh, my parents had a horrible marriage. They stayed together, but I did not believe marriage <coughs> could work. I fully did not believe you could stay in love with someone. And, and what changed married. your mind? That, I see, I still believe that when I got married. That you could. Oh, you did still believe that. Yeah, I, when I married Tim, I believed that within a year I would no longer love him. But I was going to be a good wife to him. That was just, I'd never seen a happy marriage. And so um, it, it, was, it was a real hard go for him to get me to, to agree to marry him. And it took a lot of work for him to get me to trust him again. And... Um, it finally came down, to, it, it actually, it, it was a matter of a ton of prayer, and I finally uh, said I didn't want to see him for the summer, and I would tell him in September, it's like a old song, 
none of y'all are old enough to remember it, so I won't sing it. But um, anyway, I made it till July 4th, and he, we, we got engaged. And I, it was like, all of a sudden, I just knew. So, but I was terrified of marriage. I was terrified all the way. And then what happened is we'd been married a year, and we were walking out of our apartment, because we had one car, and we were going to the, to the university, and it suddenly dawned on me that we had passed the one-year mark, and I still loved him. And I just turned to him, I went, oh my gosh, do you know I still love you? <laughs> and I, you know, I was just like, this is so great, awesome, oh my gosh, I still love you. And he's like, I thought that was the general idea. <laughs> So yeah, I don't know, but I had a real hard time. I didn't believe love could work last. I didn't believe, believe marriage could work, um, and I was wrong. Thank goodness. So, Christian, you didn't get to answer the question. Are you are you terrified of? How will you know when you're ready to get married? Is that was that your answer question? Sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm not I'm not terrified of that. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not scared of commitment either. It's just I haven't found that person yet. Um, I'm not sure when I'll know. You know, my dad and my mom, when they met, they were 19 and 20. And uh, my mom was a nurse, my dad was a paramedic, and my dad said the first time he saw my mom, he just knew that that was who he was going to marry. Uh, and you know, kids getting married at a young age, you know, that sometimes does work out too, because my grandparents were 18. They've been married. Yeah, but how many people do you know now? Exactly, it's an anomaly, but it does happen. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm not sure when I'll know, and I'm not sure when I'll be ready either. You know, I'm not sure you can put a date on that uh, because everybody's situation is different. You know, two people are the same, so I think it's just individual, and you know, hopefully we'll know when that happens. Anyone have questions? I have another question. Sure. Yeah. Do you guys? Do you have another question? Okay. I want to ask about red flags. Like, how do you know? When should you? <laughs> How do you know it's a red flag for you? Because what some people might want to put up with. Um, well, I, I think faith discussions are important. Um, I think it's important to be of at least generally the same faith. I mean, if you're a devout uh, Buddhist, you probably don't want to be dating a devout Christian. If you're, you know, whatever. I mean, you should, I think, faith similarities. If you're a, an atheist, then probably want to go with someone who's at least an agnostic. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm glad you touched on that because something that I don't think we talk enough about is mental illness. And that's another part of the two-year thing. Because um, people can pretend that they're normal for a while, but not generally say for two years. And let's say I mean, you've got narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and not to say that any of those makes a person ineligible for marriage, but don't you think it's better to know that before you get married than to figure it out after you're married? And know if you're willing to accept it. And know if you can, and if, if you're you not, can, you know, if you don't. can handle it. Um, if you've got the, the, the inner strength to uh, always be able to, to help someone because, you know, there are, there, mental illness is on the rise just because uh, society is kind of falling apart around us. So, I mean, if you haven't decided on a major, I think you should go into psychiatry because that's a growing business. <laughs> um, but I, I think that's a, not necessarily a red flag, but a flag. To, to know about. Now, I had a massive uh, breakdown when we been when I was 37, because I had um, something real catastrophic happen real suddenly, and it broke open 15 years of memories that I didn't even know I had suppressed, and they were just all uh, overwhelming when they all broke out at one time, and I went into a six-year-long depression. Yeah. And the first three years were marked with terror, and the second three years 
remarked with rage. <laughs> and probably the three years of rage were worse on Tim. They were easier on me because it's easier to be enraged than it is to be absolutely phobically afraid. But I mean, who knew? I mean, so even if you, if, if this is something you're thinking about, I mean, I didn't know that was in my future. But you know, I knew commitment. I didn't remember but things, but I didn't know. Right, so he, he wrote it out. He, I mean, he was great. He did the grocery shopping, he did the cooking, he did the laundry, because I had mass, I couldn't leave my bedroom for five weeks. Because if I started down the hall, I would have a massive panic attack. I couldn't leave the house for three years. At three years, I got out and I walked around our house twice and I went back in. And that was a big deal that I was able to walk around the house. So, I mean, I went from being the perfect wife because, you know, in my mind, it had turned into if I'm perfect, I'll be safe. And so, man, I, you know, I was the perfect wife. And I went from there to, you know, being hospitalized for suicidal stuff and weighing 232 pounds. I went from like a size 6 to a size 22, I think. Yeah. And, uh, and when I came out of it, it was like moving from hell to heaven. It was just because I didn't even know I was going to come out of it. You know, we didn't know if I was going to. So, but <coughs> that's something. But he had the character <coughs> to stand by me and be steadfast. Both my brothers said, told him they would have divorced me. And incidentally, both of them are divorced. <laughs> uh, but Tim had the strength of character to stand by me during all that. So, red flags. How do you know it's a red flag? Mm. Do you guys want to answer? Want to answer? I feel like you don't know a red flag until after the fact. Like, let's be real. The last guy I dated, after the fact, I'm thinking, yeah, you came up to me and told me all the girls you slept with, and I can count on them without my toes, my hands. I need your toes, your hands, your toes, your hands, and I still stay with you. It's like hard for you to say what's a red flag when somebody approach you because that's when the infatuation comes by. Well, I'm going to love you past all this pain. And, <laughs> and you know what? I'm going to pray with you and we're going to make it through. And it works. It works in rare cases. But it don't work in all cases because let's be real, we in a college state and a lot of these guys just run a game in line. The only red flag you need to know is that your heart is important, your heart is sacred, and your heart needs to be valued. If it don't feel right, that's your red flag to get up and leave. You know, we, we grow up watching Disney movies and, and how to lose a guy in ten, 10 days, and yes, on those movies, love conquers all. And in real life, it may happen to a, a good 10%, but it ain't for everybody. It's always that exception. So if it don't feel right, put on your Nikes, and run on out the door. <laughs> so you, you're not sitting, and I mean, you know, you learn from heartbreak. You know, sometimes you have to be open to it. But let's be real, sometimes love doesn't.